Okay, um, well thanks for sticking around, I know it's the last talk of the day, everyone probably wants to uh, head off to the after party, um, but welcome to my talk, uh, Cracking the Perimeter. So, um, my talk is, uh, it's mostly a tool talk to be honest, um, so for the next sort of 40, 45 minutes I'm going to give you a quick overview of um, some of the problems that we encountered during uh, red team engagements, um, getting that initial access. And then I'll kind of move on to um, talking about um, some tool development that we did internally. Uh, we released to the community in, in March. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about the journey of this tool, really. Some of, once we released it, there was um, some kind of uh, active uh, response to it from the defensive community. And then I'll talk about some of the, um, the, the bypasses and things that we found around this and, and released in future updates. Um, so who am I? Well, my name is Dominic Chell. Um, I work for a company called MDSEC. Um, I am responsible for uh, MDSEC's um, CBEST and uh, STAR services, um, which means I tend to f uh, find myself uh, focusing a lot of my time on uh, what I now call uh, rainbow team testing. Uh, the reason for this is mainly just because um, I kept hearing about all these new colours and I, I wanted to just kind of make sure that I didn't miss any of them. So I thought I'd kind of uh, go full spectrum like NCC do and uh, put them all in the rainbow. Um, so, um, background. Um, so getting a foothold on an internal network is, or what I find, is often one of the most time-consuming um, aspects of a red team engagement. Um, I find myself um, spending a lot of time, um, you know, testing um, my payloads with various AV solutions on kind of various EDRs and what, whatnot, trying to find gaps. Um, so I wanted to kind of like streamline some of this. Uh, but what I found was actually once we get onto the network, things really fly by. Um, and I guess the reason for this is um, there's been quite a lot of research into um, lateral movement techniques, into Active Directory, uh, there's development of tools of things like Bloodhound, uh, Crapmap Exec, uh, Death Star, um, things uh, which are tools which are really there to um, like streamline the, the kind of um, lateral movement phase of a red team engagement. <laughs> Um, I, I think there's been kind of less focus on uh, the actual initial access. In fact, there's a lot less kind of tools really for, the, for these sorts of things. Uh, in fact, the only ones that I can really think of um, off the top of my head are things like um, Unicorn from uh, Trusted Sec and uh, there's another tool called uh, Starfighters by a guy called C. Nealers. Um, so uh, we used to use like PowerShell quite a lot in our engagements. Um, but to be honest, I think my general opinion is PowerShell is pretty much dead now. Um, some people may disagree with me, um, but there is a, a, a real um, focus from defenders on looking for PowerShell attacks. So um, anytime we could uh, create a payload where we'd actually be able to run uh, a command, we would try and use PowerShell to actually get into memory. Um, and this was a great way to evade things like antivirus. Um, the reason for this was mainly because um, once you got into memory, you generally had a free pass. Um, but the downside is really PowerShell is uh, very easy to um, signature uh, both statically, um, so looking for people trying to call uh, PowerShell.exe, so if you've got command line logging in place or you've got process spawn chains, if you ever see something like Word running like PowerShell.exe, then that's pro probably a bad thing. Um, then with Windows 10, uh, we, we had the introduction of AMZ, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about later, but that basically provided AV engines direct access to memory so they could um, apply the, uh, the standard signatures uh, for doing, for doing uh, memory analysis. Um, we've also seen the rise of sandboxing technologies, um, things like FireEye, uh, Bromium, um, and uh, th these typically uh, run your payloads inside a micro VM, um, and if they spot uh, bad behavior, then they won't, they'll stop the payload kind of getting to the end user. We've also got various um, products like Silence, Palo Alto Traps that describe themselves as being uh, kind of next generation AV uh, and supposedly don't rely on signatures. Um, we also occasionally have difficulties actually getting the payloads into the environment. So um, we used to use things like HDAs quite a lot, um, but what we found was um, because they gained popularity, um, people starting to block the application HTA MIME type. Um, they were blocking the .hta extension on the perimeter, so you couldn't actually get those file types into the network in the first place. Um, we spent a bit of time using uh, like exploits for public vulnerabilities. So. Um, there was quite a recent spate of office bugs, um, but again, we found these were very easy signatures. Uh, traditional AV was often picking these up quite quickly. Um, so overall, my general opinion was sort of last 12 to 18 months or so, we, we felt that the red team engagement has been getting a lot harder. 
So what I wanted to do was um, focus on developing some tooling around this, um, basically to um, streamline the process of, of testing, creating payloads, um, and try and bi build in some techniques that might help us um, evade some of these uh, defensive protections. Um, so I released a tool in uh, March this year called uh, Sharpshooter, and then I've kind of released uh, several kind of iterations of updates um, since then. Uh, we've been using this tool quite a lot on red team engagements. I've had a lot of success with it. Um, we've used it to bypass a number of kind of next-gen security controls, things like Fire, uh, FireEye, Silence, uh, Bromium, piloted traps, uh, we, as well as kind of like traditional AV, um, so like Windows Defender and, and McAfee as well. Um, it also got uh, featured in uh, Hacker's Playbook. I don't know if anybody's read this book, but it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, so Hacker's Playbook 3, Red Team Edition, uh, they, they had a couple of pages on, on kind of how the tool works and, and some of the functionality inside it, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, so what does the tool do? Um, well, it basically allows you to create um, staged and stageless payloads for the majority of the Windows-based um, scripting formats. So um, HTML applications, JavaScript files, VB script files, Windows script files, and uh, VBA. Um, so staged basically means that you get a small bit of code which will run on the endpoint, uh, which is the stager, and that will retrieve the main payload, uh, which in this case is actually um, some C-sharp source code. So there was a, t a talk actually earlier this morning with, with some similar techniques to, to, to what we do with uh, staged. Um, stageless basically is the full code is embedded inside uh, the script file and when it executes it, it does everything that you need it to do. And that might be you know, running some shell code, uh, like running your implant, whatever. Um, so the tool's got some defensive uh, evasion techniques built into it. Uh, these include things like um, sandbox detection and uh, another technique called HTML smuggling, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, so how does it work? Well, at the heart of uh, the Sharpshooter is a tool called uh, .NET JJ Script. Uh, it was written by a guy called uh, James Forshaw. Um, essentially, uh, .NET JJ Script um, provides a full .NET interoperability through com interfaces. Um, and that basically exposes them to a Windows script host. So what that means is you can take an arbitrary compiled .NET program, embed it as a serialized object, uh, and then you can access that object um, to call .NET methods on it through um, JavaScript or VB scripts. Um, so the way Sharpshooter works is it basically takes the .NET to JScript loader, um, it takes the Sharpshooter serialized object, um, it then encrypts it with um, a random key using RC4, Base64 encodes it, and then embeds it inside whatever file format that you want to use. Uh, and then it's got a small little harness that will, uh, when run on the endpoint, will um, decode uh, and decrypt the payload when, and execute it. So the, the kind of flow for that looks a little bit like this. So the user gets like a HTML file, it decrypts um, a uh, script, uh, which then again decrypts some more content, and then that uses .NET to JS. Uh, and in a staged scenario, it retrieves the full payload either via DNS, uh, web delivery, or it can do both. And then it compiles the source code on the on the endpoint using uh, .NET's code DOM compiler, and then uses reflection to actually call um, the uh, the methods on the serialized object. Um, so what you could actually do is, I mean, you, you can run anything with this. You, you could use it to run shell code to kind of retrieve and, and install your implant. Uh, you could use it to run Mimikatz to pretty much do anything from um, you know just from from JavaScript. Um, so I've been using this technique for actually quite a while in some other tools, uh, and I was kind of curious to see whether or not um, anyone else was using it. So uh, I, did, I did a few searches on Twitter, and I found this tweet from uh, Rich Warren, uh, and he was basically describing um, some some real live malware in, in the wild um, that was using uh, Code DOM. So if we kind of zoom in on this, it's actually doing something very similar to what what my uh, what my code was doing. So again, I kind of thought that was pretty interesting. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how you kind of go, the approach to kind of using this tool. So before we start any kind of campaign, we invest quite a lot of time in reconnaissance. We tr really try and kind of understand our target, what their environment looks like. If you're using Sharpshift as target um, a, a user, then there's a few things that you're actually interested in in advance. So you, you want to know the version of .NET that is on the endpoint. Uh, the reason for this is basically the payload needs to be uh, tailored to match the same version of .NET as what the user is using. So if the user is using um, 
like Windows 7, they're probably on uh, version uh, 3.5 of the .NET framework, whereas Windows 10 is more likely to be uh, version 4. Um, secondly, if you're intending to execute um, shellcode in the existing process uh, on the endpoint, then you need to know what the architecture of the endpoint is. Um, the only real exception to this that I've seen is uh, with HDA files, uh, which are always 32-bit. Um, the reason for this is, I believe, because um, mshda.exe is 32-bit process even on 64-bit systems. Um, so to get around, it is possible to actually get around that requirement, uh, and I intend to add something, a new template, which will basically spawn a 32-bit process, inject the shellcode into it, so you only ever actually need to use 32-bit shellcode. So how do we kind of go about doing this recon? Um, well, it's actually really simple. Um, so most client-side software will actually leak a lot of this information. Um, so we only really need to get the user, trick them into opening an email or trick them into clicking a phishing link. Um, so for example, we might send in um, a phishing email that includes a remotely hosted image. Um, and when they when they open that email, uh, out, if they're using Outlook, for example, it will try and render that image. And what we actually get is um, the user agent coming back from Outlook. Um, so if we look at a, a very simple example here, we can see uh, we've got like the version of the .NET CLR, so like they're using like 3.5. We can see the version of uh, Office they're using, and we can see it says WoW 64. So if it's WoW 64, it just means it's 32-bit uh, Office on 64-bit uh, host. Um, so from one very simple email, uh, and the user, as I say, the user doesn't actually even need to click on anything, they just need to open the email, we're actually able to get quite a lot of uh, useful information about the target in advance. Um, so now we've got enough information to build one of these payloads, how do we actually go about getting it into the environment? Um, so, well, Sharpshooter actually uses a, a very clever little technique called HTML smuggling, which was again uh, found by uh, Rich Warren, Buffalo Overflow on uh, Twitter. Um, and basically the way this works is you can take any arbitrary file and then you can use the JavaScript Web Crypto APIs to encrypt that file uh, and store it inside a HTML file. And then um, you embed that the RC4 key inside the file and then when the user opens the HTML file, it will just use the uh, crypto APIs to decrypt the file and serve it to the user. Uh, the way it serves it to the user is it uses the um, the MS save blob web storage method. So that even though um, the uh, the file is getting served to the user, the proxy will actually only ever see a HTML file with the content type text HTML. Uh, plus, Outlook actually um, supports opening HTML files as attachments, so you could just email the user that HTML file, so you could send them whatever you want. You, you could actually send them exes and things if you wanted to, but smuggled inside a HTML file. So it's a, it's a really cool little technique. Um, so there's two templates that I included inside Sharpshooter to do this. One of them kind of mocks up a, um, a fake page, making it look like uh, the file had been scanned by McAfee. But you can really kind of dress this up however you want to based on your phishing campaign. Um, Sharpshooter's got a few techniques in there to do sandbox evasion. Uh, these are mostly inspired by uh, Chris and Brendan's uh, Check Please project. Um, so the theory is um, sandboxes will do automated analysis on a payload. Uh, they'll basically looking for some form of bad behavior. If they don't see that bad behavior, they'll mark the file as safe, and then it ends up getting served to the user. So if we're able to actually only limit our bad behavior um, to outside of the sandbox, then it might be possible to kind of circumvent this um, protection. Uh, so Sharpshoot has got a number of techniques to do this. Uh, it does domain keying. So uh, if we're able to actually figure out the internal Active Directory name of the company in advance, um, then we can say only ever run on this AD uh, joint domain. Uh, and actually, I, I don't think there's been an occasion where I've not been able to figure out the internal domain from the outside. And I'll, sh I'll show you a couple of techniques on, on the next couple of slides. Um, we can we can key the payload to only ever run on domain joint systems. So things like um, FireEye have like predefined guest images, um, and users don't won't typically join these to the domain, so they're not not typically domain joined. So um, if it hits one of these uh, predefined guest images and it's not domain joined, you don't the, the payload won't ever run because it's not on a domain member. Uh, then it will do things like uh, check for various sandbox artifacts, things like like VirtualBox, tool, uh, VMware tools, that kind of thing. Uh, it'll look for bad MAC addresses, things that are typically used by virtualization. Uh, and then if, it, if anybody's doing any analysis on it, it will check whether it's being debugged. But essentially, if, it, if any of these conditions are met, the, the actual uh, payload, the main payload won't run. So how do we kind of go about the Active Directory names? 
Um, well, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Um, one of the tricks that we've had a lot of good success with is um, targeting companies who've, who've got Skype for Business uh, deployments. Um, so if you've got um, Skype for Business and you've got a front-end edge server, um, what you'll find is there's a, a default host name that Skype for Business uses to locate the front-end edge servers, and that front-end edge server will leak the internal AD name or the, the, the FQDN inside one of the headers. So you can see here, for example, we, we're looking at uh, FireEye.com. We can see the host name for this uh, FireEye's uh, Skype server is SRV USMI link 01.fireeye.com. So it probably means that their internal AD domain is FireEye.com. If we look at another example, uh, carbonblack.com. Uh, so this time we can see uh, the, the, the FQDN for this server is UK SFB FE1. Bit .local. So we could probably speculate that the internal uh, domain name for carbonblack.com is bit9.local. The reason for that is uh, bit9 were obviously uh, originally acquiring, uh, carbonblack were changed the name from bit9. Um, so with that kind of information, we can, we can basically try and key our payloads to only ever run on those um, specific uh, AD systems. Um, I also mentioned earlier that uh, Sharpshooter can work on the concept of staging. So the stager in Sharpshooter um, will basically retrieve some C# -sharp source code um, that has been zipped, Base64 encoded, and it will do this via HTTP or HTTPS. Uh, but it can also do it through DNS um, using another tool that I wrote called uh, PowerDNS. Um, what that does is the PowerDNS tool will basically uh, provide like a fake uh, DNS server. It will you can tell it any file that you want it to serve via DNS. It will split that file up into chunks, and then um, every uh, and then the, the payload will uh, make DNS text lookups to the fake DNS server to to download the the actual payload and then reconstruct it on the client side. Um, Sharpshooter kind of does this iteratively by um, calling nslookup.exe on the command line. Um, the reason for this is there is no um, native library on uh, version 3.5 of the .NET framework to do uh, text lookups. So uh, let's look at um, a little example of um, Sharpshooter running against uh, Palo Alto traps. So, I videoed all the demos because uh, I've done talks before. So. <laughs> okay, so first thing we're going to do is uh, basically just uh, create... So, sorry, I went a little bit too fast there. That's what my wife says as well. <laughs> um, so the first the first thing I'm going to do is uh, basically just create the uh, new sharpshooter. So it's, it runs through a Python script, uh, targeting uh, version 2 of the .NET framework, creating like a HDA file. Uh, and giving it some shell code. Uh, we're telling it to use HTML smuggling and use the McAfee template. So what it does is it'll actually go here and create uh, a HDA, which we, we don't actually need to use, and it'll also create like a, a HTML file. Uh, I'm then going to um, take that HTML file and uh, just host it on the Cobalt Strikes web server. So all I'm doing is literally hosting the HTML file now. Uh, and then I've got... I've got a Windows 7 uh, VM with uh, Palo Alto traps and it's like fully enabled. Just browse to the, the HTML file. So you can see up here it's a HTML. And then that serves a download to the user. And assuming they open it, uh, we get a beacon back. Uh, so we're, we're able to like fully pass and we've got like full, uh, full two AC2. So we're able to kind of fully uh, bypass Palo Alto traps. <laughs> Um, so shortly after I released the tool, uh, it started to get signatured uh, by quite a lot of the, the AV, well, a few of the AV vendors. Um, Microsoft actually uh, created a signature for it, an AMSI signature. So anytime you use it in Windows Defender or anytime you actually used uh, .NET to JScript in Windows Defender, um, it would flag it as being a sharpshooter payload. It was probably inconvenient for all the other people who were using .NET to JScript. Um, but effectively, they were they were detecting on the primitive that uh, .NET to JScript was using for doing the uh, the comment drop. 
Um, so that kind of led to uh, the tool being proclaimed dead um, by uh, Casey Smith on Twitter. Uh, so this was in April. Um, but kind of again in June, I thought, well, I'll start to relook at this again. Uh, maybe I can do some updates. Um, so in June, I just took the default payload. So I just took the default HTML file, stuck it in VirusTotal just to see what, see what the kind of outcome was. And even still, uh, it was still like five out of 58 detections. Uh, and if I took like the default HDA file, uh, it's, it was still only 14 out of 58. So, um, I wouldn't necessarily, wouldn't have necessarily said it was dead, but I kind of thought, well, I'll, I'll take a look at it again anyway and, and try and re resurrect it, see if I could bring it back from the dead. Um, so the first thing to do was really look at, uh, what Defender was doing how it was detecting the payload. Um, and what I noticed was that Defender didn't actually um, care about the copy of the payload on disk. Um, the alert was tied to an AMSI signature. Uh, so when you run it, um, AMSI was providing uh, Defender access to memory and um, it was basically signaturing on that. Um, so if you're not familiar with what AMSI is, um, it's Microsoft's uh, anti-malware scan interface uh, introduced in Windows 10. Um, so this is basically like a standard interface that uh, allows any kind of security products, it's not just Windows Defender, to get access to memory um, so that they can scan for malicious code. Um, and the way it works is that AMSI is actually implemented as a DLL. Uh, the DLL is then loaded through every PowerShell or Windows script host session. Um, one of the most effective things about AMSI is that because it runs inside the scripting engine, um, it basically allows the AV engine to actually get access to the plain, deobfuscated code, uh, which obviously makes signature detection a lot more powerful because the AV engine doesn't need to deal with any kind of obfuscation that's going on anymore. Um, so is AMSI something we need to worry about as a red team? At? Well, I thought this kind of tweet from Lee Holmes was pretty interesting. Um, basically, Lee did a breakdown of all the different AV vendors that are currently using AMSI. Um, and you can see there's not too many of them. Um, so we probably only really need to worry about AMSI if you're using Windows 10 and if uh, you're using one of these AV engines that are actually using it. So let's, let's talk about AMSI bypassers. Um, so mid-April, um, Subti, the same guy who kind of proclaimed it dead, um, basically released details on an attack, um, a second iteration of the Scribbly attacks uh, called Scribbly 2. I, did, I didn't name them, he, he named them. Um, <laughs> Well, what the attack uh, basically allowed you to do was execute um, scriptlets in full trust. Um, so, and they, these could be embedded inside an XML style sheet. And he used the, uh, the WMIC.exe command line tool to do this. Um, so while I was playing with uh, this technique, what I actually noticed was that the same sharpshooter payloads that were getting flagged by AMSI um, previously, if I put them inside a scriptlet and loaded them through WMIC, they were, they were not, the AMSI signature was not triggering. So this was really interesting to me. So I thought this was kind of, kind of cool because even though Casey originally proclaimed it dead, it kind of gave me a technique to actually resurrect some of the, uh, the, the uh, functionality. Um, so with that in mind, I decided to actually update Sharpshooter, uh, not, not only to incorporate the Squibbly2 attack, but to also inc incorporate the original Squibbly2. Um, uh, the Scribbly do attack uses uh, registerv32 uh, binary with with an SCT file. Um, so you can host the XSL or the SCT remotely, and then you use WMIC or, or registerv32 to download and execute the code inside them. Um, so to do this, uh, I basically coined a technique what I called uh, com staging into Sharpshooter. Um, in short, there are several known com methods that allow you to execute a command on the OS uh, that are accessible from the Windows script host. Um, so the ones that I decided to implement were um, the outlook.create object, which was originally discovered by Etienne Stallmans, um, wscript.run, um, shell browser window, uh, which was found by Matt Nelson from SpectreOps, uh, and then the standard kind of uh, WMI uh, start Win 32 process. Um, so so the, the idea really is Sharpshooter will now generate a little stub uh, that will uh, use these com objects to execute a command and then retrieve the kind of remotely hosted script, uh, scriptlet. Um, but then, like, I had a bit of a, a revelation. Um, it, it kind of struck me. I was, I was being a little bit stupid here. Even though this kind of technique worked well and I, I was getting around AMSI, I thought, well, 
I've got something running on the machine. I've got access to com, but I'm kind of calling out to the command line. Why do I need to call out to the command line? What if I could find something in com that would um, actually process a style sheet internally? Um, so I did a bit of searching on, on MSDN, uh, and I basically found a com interface um, called uh, XML DOM. Uh, and XML DOM can be reached um, through the Windows script host. Uh, and it's got a method inside it called uh, transform node, and that can be used to um, pass uh, an XML style sheet that's remotely hosted. Uh, and inside that XML style sheet, you can include a scriptlet which executes in full trust. Um, so the main benefit around this was um, basically I could, um, I didn't need to execute commands on the OS anymore. Um, I was able to avoid some of the indicators that are uh, associated with uh, the scribbly do attack. So things like the, the known uh, register of 32 user agent. Uh, and then um, the payloads actually becomes very, very small. Um, and you can remotely host the XSL file. The reason, and it's also very difficult to signature. The reason for this is because it, um, any kind of code that is using uh, this com object will, will have very similar, similar method calls. So if we look at an example of what the export might look like, something like this in JavaScript would actually, um, you could actually use to, to execute full um, .NET from inside the, um, the hosted style sheet. Um, so as you can see, like a legitimate tool that might be using this uh, com object will um, will probably have very similar code if it's using a style sheet. Um, so we can look at like a little uh, a little example of how to kind of do this. So I've got another video. Um, so what I'm doing this time is I'm using Sharpshooter and I'm basically creating an additional file, which is this XSL file. Uh, and this time um, we'll host it again, very similar to the previous one, but we need to host actually both files. So I'm hosting the HTML file. <coughs> and I also need to actually host the XSL as well. So we'll host the XSL here under this URL. And uh, this will basically create the uh, the little stub to run on the endpoint. So we can see we've got Windows Defender running here, Windows 10, uh, no no alerts at the moment. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll just browse to the, uh, okay, I'm sh just showing it's on again. Uh, we'll browse to the HTML file. Uh, this time, uh, you can see we're serving a JavaScript file. So we open it up, open the JavaScript file up, nothing happens. No AV alerts in uh, in Defender, no pop-ups or anything. Um, but what we should see is uh, we've actually got like the the standard kind of Cobalt Strike beacon again. So this has been able to fully bypass the uh, the Defender AMSI uh, detections. <laughs> Okay. Um, so let's let's look at uh, let's let's assume at some point uh, Microsoft blocks that technique, um, or they, they kind of add AMSI support into scriptlets. Uh, what other kind of like AMSI bypasses are there? Um, well, a guy called Tal Lieberman um, discovered a very uh, cool and very simple AMSI bypass, um, which is basically there is a registry key called AMSI enable. Um, and if it is set to zero, <laughs> it turns it off. Um, so with this in mind, um, it is possible to actually, and sorry, that registry key, as you can see, it's in, uh, it's in the current user hive. So uh, it just means like low prib standard users can actually even turn it off. Um, so with this in mind, it's actually possible to create a script which will check if the key is set. If it's not set, it will then set it. Uh, and then it will just reopen the same file that you've already downloaded. And then on the second pass, AMSI should actually be disabled. So basically means the script will get like full carte blanche. So th this is an example of how we, I wrote this yesterday. Uh, this is an example of how we kind of exploit this. Uh, basically, uh, we just check whether the registry key exists. If it doesn't exist, it throws an exception, which we catch. 
Then we write the registry key, and then it uses um, Matt Nelson's uh, shell browser window uh, com object to uh, basically just call the downloaded JavaScript file. So all we do is reopen the same file that we that we've already downloaded, uh, and on the second pass, um, AMSI's uh, fully disabled. What other techniques are there? Uh, James Forshaw, uh, he found a second AMSI bypass um, through DLL hijacking. Um, basically, what James found was, and this, this was kind of interesting, um, was that it was possible to stop the load library function from loading the AMSI DLL by convincing load library into thinking the DLL was already loaded. So you might think, well, well, how did he kind of go about that? Well, actually, it's really simple. Um, so the way he did this was basically you could copy um, the name of the, the scripting engine, so like wscript.exe. You just copy it to a known location, rename it to amzi.dll, and then run your scripts. And then what would happen is um, because the it would basically fool load library into thinking that the DLL that was loaded was amzi.dll, but really it was uh, your copy of wscript. Um, and because it couldn't, uh, because it wasn't the real AMSI DLL, it couldn't find any of the exported functions, so it would just fail safe. Uh, and then it would basically mean there was no AMSI detection. So again, a pretty simple technique. Um, so I got another uh, another quick um, demo of this technique. As I say, I only wrote this uh, this this one yesterday. Um, so again, we just we just create this the same kind of payload, uh, host it up on uh, the Cobalt Strike web server. And then if we look at the uh, the Windows 10 VM, um, so I've got the uh, I'm showing that the registry key is not actually there at the moment, but we uh, then we browse to the file, uh, it downloads uh, the JavaScript file. If we open it up. You'll see it pops up twice. So even if I click open, it clicks again, and you still get the same open. Um, and then now we can see that the actual uh, the AMSI flag is there. Uh, the JavaScript file that we downloaded is there. There's no alerts inside Defender, um, and we should we should have the uh, the full Cobalt Stride beacon again. <laughs> Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, kind of detection prevention of these types of payloads. Um, so if the payload is using the kind of code DOM reflection uh, trick, uh, you might think that the payload is, is fully compiled, generated in memory, and that's originally what I thought. So there is actually in the source code of uh, code DOM, there is a compiler parameter called generating memory is set to true. Um, but it doesn't do what you think it does. Um, basically, what it does is it takes a copy of the C sharp source code, it drops it in the Windows 10 folder, um, and then it uses um, csc.exe, which is bundled with a .NET framework, to uh, to actually compile it, get the loaded DLL, and then uh, take that loaded DLL and, and put it into memory, uh, and then use reflection on it. So uh, one possible uh, detection technique might be uh, looking for uh, random calls to uh, csc.exe. Uh, if you're using something like um, like the DNS delivery, I mentioned before that it uses uh, nslookup.exe to, to retrieve the text records. So you could look for kind of very a lot of calls, iterative calls to um, nslookup.exe. Um, or if you're looking uh, at something that's trying to bypass AMSI, you, you could just monitor for uh, any changes to the AMSI enable registry key. Um, in terms of prevention, uh, if we're talking about a Windows 10 endpoint, uh, one of the probably one of the most effective approaches is using um, device guard code integrity policy, um, which will basically allow you to um, limit scripts uh, to execution of only signed scripts. Um, you could use application whitelisting, for example, so you could block uh, things like MSHDA, wscript.exe, um, or csc.exe, because in most cases, most normal users probably won't run these. Uh, quite a quite an effective technique which I see from time to time is people creating group policy um, 
to uh, basically change the default handlers for some of these file extensions. So uh, rather than associating uh, .js um, with uh, WScript or .hda with MSHDA, you just change it to Notepad. So anytime one of these files hits the endpoint, if the user opens them, it just opens it up in Notepad. Um, or maybe even like a combination of all these. Uh, from a network perspective, um, I guess like if you if the DNS technique is quite easy to block, just stop like the kind of outbound DNS filtering, right? Um, potentially for looking for a HTML smuggling, you could look for HTML files that are using the Web Crypto APIs. Um, you'll probably get a few false positives, but it is possible. Um, so future work. I've already started development on some of these, but I'd like to add a few templates more than just shellcode execution. So you could do things like run Mimikatz quite easily. Um, I'd like to add more obfuscation, uh, particularly to like the C sharp code uh, that touches disk. It should be possible to obfuscate this. Uh, and then probably additional other file types. So Matt Nelson found um, some interesting uh, uh, files that affect Windows 10, uh, the, like the setting uh, content MS file, which is it will be quite interesting to add. Uh, you can download the tool from uh, MDSet's GitHub page. Um, also, I'd like to just thank uh, guys that I borrowed ideas from. Um, I would recommend following all these guys on Twitter because they're regularly kicking out interesting stuff. And then uh, that's it for questions. Whoops. Awesome stuff. Thanks, Dom. Has anyone got any questions? Just a quick one on the .NET to JS. Does it work with the very latest version of .NET? Because I was just messing around with .NET to JS a couple of weeks ago. I tried to compile it on like 4.6 or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and for some reason, it just moaned and said, "Now nah, it's only for like version two because they I've actually only, removed version two. So have you I've only that? tried it on like up to 4.5. So. Okay. But if they remove v2, does it? Oh, you mean if they were completely remove it? Yeah. Um, I've never tried it. To be no, that's right. no, it's, no, I didn't either. So I just. Bueller? No? Okay, so we're just going to wait for track two to, to finish before we...